Hello and welcome to this Farmer IQ webinar entitled Enterprise R&D Transformation Case Studies, Biogen and Sanofi. I'm Ben Watts, Managing Editor at IQPC Digital, and I'm here to briefly introduce today's session. Today's webinar, which is brought to you in association with Benchling, will be moderated by Lorraine Perelman, Head of Enterprise Professional Services at Benchling, who will be joined by guest speakers, Ayman Ismail, Principal Scientist, Lab Head at Sanofi, and David Sexton, Senior Director of Genome Technologies and Informatics at Biogen. They will be sharing their stories of moving away from their legacy software and how they upgraded to new solutions that have driven R&D transformations throughout their organizations. Just before we begin, this is an interactive webinar, so there is a chance to put your questions to today's hosts following the end of the discussion. To do this, simply submit them on the Q&A box on your consoles in front of you, and please make sure to click submit once you've entered your questions. Uh, we also have a couple of items in our resource center today from our friends at Benchling. These are available just underneath the main video screen in the center of your consoles, so please do check those out as well. And with the housekeeping out of the way, it's just time for me to hand over to Loren to begin today's webinar. Thanks so much for the introductions, Ben. Uh, I'm really glad to be here today with David and Ayman. Benchling has had the great fortune to partner with Biogen and Sanofi on a variety of projects uh, we've been working on over the last little bit here. And um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your backgrounds and how you got to where you are today. So David, maybe you could lead us off and tell us a bit about your background. Absolutely. Um, uh, my name is David Sexton. I'm the head of genome technology and computational sciences at Biogen, um, which is part of the research organization at Biogen. <clears throat> my background is uh, I have an undergraduate degree in molecular and cellular biology and a graduate degree in computational information systems. I've been in this field now for about 25 years, starting out uh, with sequence analysis in the early 90s and uh, have moved my way progressively through um, positions to where I am right now at Biogen. Great, thanks. Uh, Ayman, how about you? Uh, hi, so I'm a principal scientist at Sanofi. Uh, my background is in molecular biophysics and biochemistry. Uh, at Sanofi, I lead drug discovery projects in the rare and neuro department. And I also manage a protein science team that supports all biologics programs within my department. Awesome. Um, so I know both of you are in the midst of making changes to the way you track, store, and process data at your respective companies. Can you tell us a little more about the previous state and what motivated you and your colleagues to consider something new? And uh, I'll start with you, Ayman. Yeah, so um, when we were, uh, I started my career actually at Biogen, where David is right now. And uh, in 2017, Biogen spun off the department that I was in to form a company called Biovarative. And at that point, we were around 45 to 55 scientists. And it was the right time to start looking into a new system that we wanted to use for our uh, ELN because the legacy system that we had was just an ELN and everything we wanted to track outside like an inventory management system wasn't integrated into that. And we always had problem locating samples and identifying what happened with different samples. So uh, we, we wanted a better system to integrate a lot of functionalities and we tested a number of systems at the, at the time, Benchling came out on top and we adopted Benchling and we started using it at BioOperative. And uh, I was part of the team that initially looked into what programs we should be looking, we should be adopting. And um, I set up a lot of the components of Benchling at the time uh, in 2017. Uh, and then in 2018, Sanofi bought BioOperative. And uh, they were looking into what programs we're using, and they had the same legacy system that Biogen was actually using. So we were able to give them all the information that we assembled during our, uh, our search for a new electronic system. And we were lucky that we had quite a lot of information already put into Benchling. So we were able to demonstrate for them the value of moving their system into benchling from that legacy system that they were using. Thanks so much. Um, David, how about you? What motivated you and, uh, and your colleagues to consider something new? 
Yeah, um, so uh, Biogen, as, as Ayman mentioned, has had an electronic lab notebook in place for quite some time from the, from the same company that he spoke about. Um, and what we've noticed is that when we were getting requests from regulatory agencies, specifically the FDA around our investigational new drug applications, that it was very difficult for us to locate the data that they were requesting, especially after people have left the company after two to three years and that uh, you know internal understanding has left the company. It's really difficult to go back and locate data. So our our uh, motivation really was in in having uh, a new standard come in place at Biogen, fair, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. Um, and the goal here was to make sure that we, in a standard way, captured our metadata around our studies, experiments, assays, so that uh, in the future, when we needed to locate raw data or an analyze data, analytical data, we would be able to do that via a, uh, a data catalog that we were putting in place at Biogen at the same time that we were bringing uh, Benchling on board. And so we spent quite a bit of time in trying to understand what our uh, data model would be for all of our metadata that we were collecting at Biogen. And it just, it made a great deal of sense for a system like Benchling, where we're able to do structured uh, metadata capture to have something like that in place for us to be able to locate our data in the future. Gotcha. So it sounds like for both of you, it was uh, the choice was really revolving around the need to track whether it be materials, data, or a combination of all of those. Um, and, you know, it sounds like you have a pretty clear picture of why you chose to move into Benchling, but I'm curious, um, have people generally been receptive to change or have you encountered some resistance or maybe even apathy? Um, maybe David, you could tell us a little bit about that first. Sure, I, I think as anybody knows in working with scientists, enthusiasm can be very mixed. Um, you have some people who want to adopt it very quickly and you have some people who maybe aren't as computationally savvy who, who are a bit more resistant. And so you have a couple of options that you can take. You can take the carrot approach or the stick approach. Um, and, and we did a little bit of both. Um, so as far as the carrot approach, what we told people was that we would only require them to enter data once into a single system. And then that data would follow them into any subsequent systems that they needed to use it in via an API. Um, and that seemed to um, make people quite happy. They, in, in their typical workflow right now, they do have several systems where they need to enter data and to remove that redundancy would, would make them quite happy. And then we, we did take a little bit of a, a stick approach as well in uh, telling people that it was gonna be a requirement that they enter data in, into Benchling, um, but that they would ultimately see uh, results from that where they would, you know, in the past, maybe they hadn't been able to see everything that was going on in the study because it was separated into uh, different ELN entries um, and they couldn't see across the entire study. Now they have one place where they can go to see everything that might be happening on their study. And I think for most people, once they see that in practice, it will make them quite happy. Gotcha. And I'm in what's the experience been like at Sanofi? So scientists don't always like to change the way they're doing their work, right? It's, it's, you're right, there will be always some resistors, but what we found that really works well for, uh, for our groups is to show them the system in action. So we were sort of lucky, like I mentioned, that we had already quite a lot, uh, quite a lot of information entered into Benchling from our days at Biovarative. So when, when we started working with the Sanofi groups, we didn't show them a PowerPoint presentation. We didn't show them, you know, a, a list of items that, that uh, have a discussion around why benchling would be beneficial for them. We actually just went into the system and opened it and told them, okay, let's assume we're doing an experiment today. Here, here is how I'm going to identify where my samples are and how much I have of each sample and what's the concentration. Here's how I'm going to identify what are the other experiments that were done with this sample? And here's how I'm going to create new batches and enter new information in the registry and keep it up to date and keep our uh, inventory system up to date. So when, when they see how all of the system is working together, it's an interconnected system and everything is literally one click away from the next entity or the next experiment that you want to have a look at, 
generally the reception has been really positive. I haven't seen anyone saying, oh, we can stay with the system that we're using right now. Almost everyone was asking, okay, when can we start using Benchling? This was really a positive reception. So uh, I think you know, showing people how the system works is, is really helpful and convincing them that they should move into, into such a system. Gotcha. Um, and I'm curious, given that you're coming from a position where the solution was already partially in place, at least for some folks, um, what differences have you noticed as you've begun implementing Benchling more broadly within the Sanofi organization? And in particular, how did how is that experience relative to previous solutions that you've worked with? I'll start with you, Iman. So uh, one of the big benefits as a business value for, for benchling is increased compliance with notebooking requirements. When you have a system that is speedy, that has a simple interface that's easy to use, and it covers all your needs, the scientists stop seeing it as an impediment to doing their work. They start seeing it as a helping hand in designing and executing their experiments. So, so one, one big thing we're seeing is increased compliance with notebooking requirements. And also, a lot of time people before started using benchling were just wasting time doing non-value producing work, like identifying if they have enough adequates for any sample they want to use, right? Now they are mostly focused on just getting on with the science. They're not, they're, they're not wasting their time anymore. Um, so, so these are some of the two big changes that we're seeing already. And you know, looking into the future, we have all our data, we're trying to put it in these structured relational tables and benchling warehouse. And later on in the future, we can take advantage of all of these data to train machine learning model, and that can help us in our digital transformation that's ongoing at Sanofi. So it sounds like the, the process has been a lot more streamlined relative to other solutions that you've worked with in the past. Is that safe to say? Absolutely. absolutely yeah. um, and David, at um, Biogen, what kind of experience have you had implementing Benchling uh, versus other solutions in the past? Well, it's it's been quite easy to work with Benchling as a low code or no code uh, system. We've been able to quickly go in and set up our schemas and relationships between our schema tables uh, in the system and provide uh, templates for the users to use very, very quickly. It's been a, a rapid development process um, and we've been happy with the feedback that we've been getting from our scientific teams. In fact, I had a scientist recently tell me that um, he uh, kind of liked the system and he, he thinks he's gonna be able to use it, which is high praise from a scientist, honestly. Um, so we're, we're very happy with the direction that things are going. One of the, the major spinoff benefits for us has been that um, per our projects, our internal Biogen pro projects, we're now able to go in and say, all right, what are the studies that were, um, what, what kind of studies are taking place across those projects? Um, can we see all of the data that's available against that? What are the assets that we're creating? What animals, what cell lines? What are the test articles that we're creating? Where are they located? How much of those do we have? That's a capability that we've never had in the past. And, and putting that at the fingertips of the leadership so that they, they have a bit of a 360 view on what's going on in their projects has been incredibly useful. The other uh, major, uh, I think, advantage for us is just in collaboration. Um, so oftentimes our projects, you hand your work to another group who you may not see uh, you know, on a daily basis and the ability to collaborate in the system and tell people that either you need to request in, uh, uh, something from them or that you're passing something to them um, has been uh, something that's, that's very much increased the speed of our workflows. So that's something that maybe we hadn't been thinking about when we were thinking about only wanting to make sure that we had our data structured, that's actually been an advantage for us as well. Okay, that's great to hear. Uh not only consolidating data, but improving the overall experience, streamlining it. Um, you know, it's it's kind of easy to talk about this now that it's happening. Uh, I'm curious, David, what challenges you had in convincing 
management early that benchling was the right solution, if any? Yeah, I, I think it was around um, just the amount of work that they thought it would be to, to actually um, have to input the amount of data that we were looking at for structured data capture. But I think they've been pleasantly surprised that um, in the vast majority of cases, that data is coming from other systems and is just via API. We're bringing it in the Benchling for people to use in Benchling. Um, the amount of information that we're asking people to input has been relatively small and uh, certainly a bit less than we were requiring with our ELN. So, so like Iman said, that's increased our compliance for uh, use of Benchling. Uh, and I think our management is quite happy with that. And Iman, I know you you come from an interesting situation again, where you already had the solution, so it sort of adopted in, so to speak. Um, did you face any resistance from upper management in broadening the use of Benchling within the organization, or was it pretty straightforward? So I think on the management side, what drove the decision is cost and regulatory requirements, like like David mentioned. Um, on 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 the uh, regulatory requirements side, uh, Sanofi leadership has recognized early on that we need a set of rules for good research practices. For for example, what type of data we're capturing, how we're capturing it, what's the information that we're capturing, do we have full traceability of the source material used in any uh, any assay, any data that's generated, and do we have a full life cycle management for all our data? And and I think. Benchling capabilities dove in very well with, with those requirements. So it was sort of an easy task to convince them that Benchling will allow all our scientists to adopt these good research practices and and instill them in all their work. Um, and, uh, you know, there are other, other things like, for example, consent forms for patient samples. Uh, some people receive samples, they leave after few years and, and someone wants to use those samples, but there's a consent form that's attached with them. And if you don't know where it is, you don't know if you can use those samples or not. For But for, within Benchling, now you have a registry system where you can actually document all these consent forms within one place. So there are lots of advantages like this that, that allow the management to see the real benefit of compliance in general with any regulatory requirements. Um, on the cost side, obviously there was a lot of uh, discussions about the cost, and then they did a cost analysis for all the systems that Benchling might be replacing within uh, Sanofi. Uh, we have to remember always Benchling is a SaaS, so it's an SAAS, so you don't have to think about server maintenance on site or, or uh, IT infrastructure per se. Benchling takes care of all of that in AWS. So uh, the, doing the cost analysis also helped in that aspect, convincing uh, the leadership. Um, one, one area that's very near and dear to my heart, um, kind of along the same lines, is the sunk cost fallacy. You know, I imagine at both Sanofi and Biogen, you had legacy systems that a lot of energy had been put into. Um, and I'm curious what what drives that change, um, what what it made it easier to drive the change from an existing or legacy system into a new one. And as sort of a corollary, how is the decision serving the business currently? And David, I'll start with you. Sure. Um, and I think the, the main thing that drives the change is really functionality. Um, the current system that we had in place doesn't have the same sorts of functionality that Benchling has this ability to, to set up um, the, the structured data capture, the ability to have requests in the system, the, the laboratory information or research information management components that uh, Benchling has are not present in our current ELN. So it was a bit easier, I would say, for us as we came to the end of life, essentially, for our ELN to make the decision to go with a, a more modern environment. And similar to, to what Ayman just said, um, having a SaaS system, a software as a service system, um, was critical to us as well. So we didn't have to have the same IT uh, overhead and management of internal servers uh, that actually are quite costly. Um, even though it seems like it wouldn't be to control your own servers, it's uh, quite quite expensive in terms of people and, and infrastructure. 
so it was, uh, I would say, a, a bit easier to to talk to management and and let them know that there really isn't a sunk cost here. This is uh, opportunity and functionality and capability that we currently don't have that we absolutely must have in a modern environment. And Ayman, how about you? So what you spent on legacy systems, you already spent it. Keep using those legacy systems is not going to give you back that investment, right? So you have to look to the future. What, what are the systems that you want to have in place to allow you to execute on your research requirements, your, your regulatory requirements? And um, I think this is where, where people should, should focus more rather than on keep holding on to all systems that they have in place just because they spent enough money on it. Think of it like having a phone, right? We all had flip phones. Did we think, well, we already paid money for those flip phones and therefore we shouldn't upgrade to smartphones? Almost everyone upgraded, right? So I, I, this, this is the way I think about, uh, you know, this sunk cost fallacy thing. You, you can keep holding on to the past and, and being shackled by the systems that you have, uh, or, or you can just adopt new system and allow you to save money in the future and, and have a more nimble organization and, and the more efficient organization. So you're saying you're going to have to upgrade your, uh, your ELN every year to get a better camera then? Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, check. luckily for us, Benchling keep upgrading their product. I mean, there's a big difference between 2017 when we started using Benchling and today, like the Insight module wasn't there. And, you know, all the features that uh, David was mentioning uh, moments ago about how they can identify for leadership all the different sound lines produced for, for different uh, projects. All of this is built into the Insight module that is now just part of your notebook. That's really an amazing feature right there. And that just came online about a year ago, right? You kind of hit on the next thing I wanted to talk about anyway, which is um, I'd love to hear about the experience that you've been having with our customer experience and in particular professional services team, because, uh, you know, we know in this in this line of work that um, the software is amazing. Part of what brings it to the table, so to speak, is the services organization. So, um, David, can you tell us a little bit about your experience so far with our team? Absolutely. So, I mean, we've been closely working with the, the, the team um, with help building out our templates that our scientists are going to be using and having that team actually sit and meet with our scientists. Our scientists understanding that the team that they're working with are our scientists as well and understand their work um, and can fill in maybe some of the, the uh, information that the scientists don't necessarily relay because that, that team understands exactly how the science happens in the lab has been critical for us. And um, it's a very good working relationship between the scientists and, and, and the team at, at Benchling as far as really getting in and understanding how the work happens at Biogen, understanding the workflows that go on at Biogen and being able to reflect that in the application. Um, how about you, Ayman? It's It's been really uh, great to work with the teams that you guys have been assigning to us. Uh, the, the one important thing to remember is that a lot of the guys that you, you are assigning to us are actual scientists. They're not just IT engineers who can't understand what an SPR is or what NGS, next generation sequencing is. They're actual scientists. They've worked in the lab. They know what we're talking about. So when you sit with them and explain to them your process or your workflow, they, they can absolutely nail it from almost the first try every time when they're trying to develop your templates or your uh, workflow. So it's, it, th this has been really great point uh, with uh, the benchling customer service. And I have to say it's been, you know, quite a good uh, timeline that they put in. It's a short timeline. They execute on time, sometimes ahead of time. So when we're deploying any any template or any new workflow that we want to develop, we're not spending month and month just waiting for the solution to come in. Sometimes it's coming in within two, three weeks, sometimes within a month, depending how complex it is. But the, the benchling uh, teams have been very responsive and they understand exactly what we're talking about and they, they really execute really well. 
So we, we've been really happy with that experience. That's uh, great to hear from both of you. All of our professional services team have advanced degrees and many PhDs in, uh, in the sciences. So definitely helps a lot. Um, looking at the implementation a bit more, I'm, I'm curious to hear a bit about your experience with uh, Benchling's approach to governance and the overall data model and what's been working well, um, what's been enabling for you and so on at your respective organizations. Um, Ayman, why don't you tell us about the experience at Sanofi? So actually data model is a really important uh, parameter to try to figure out early on as you're doing your benchling deployment. Um, the good thing about benchling is that they allow you to develop any data model you want. They don't have a fixed set of uh, parameters that you have to abide with. You can develop any entity with any uh, metadata that you, you want, but uh, also that that leaves the onus basically on the company. And, and my advice to any company that doesn't have a, a data governance person or team to actually set up that team, have, have a data governance uh, team that, that understands exactly what the data should be and how it should be correlated with itself. Because, um, uh, you know, this, this is something as, as you're deploying benchling into the organization, this is something that's going to be the background of everything that you're doing within the system. So if you don't have it set up properly, as you grow the organization, you're going to start hitting some problems and have to fix them later on. So Benchling's giving you an appropriate scaffold, but the flexibility to do it your way. Is that yeah, yeah, awesome. And uh, David, are you having a similar experience? Yes, we are having a similar experience, and I would say that the majority of the work that we've done upfront with Benchling really is in data modeling. And the way that we're approaching this is that you know we have a variety of templates, both for the in vivo and the in vitro space. And what we want to do is put in place a, a data model that allows us the maximum flexibility because we can't predict you know, the, the types of methodologies that are gonna appear in the future. And we wanna have maximum flexibility to be able to create any template that um, we might not even be thinking of right now uh, in the future. Um, and so a, a good piece of our work has been doing what I call creating the Lego blocks for this system. So the idea of going in and creating the schemas that um, would allow us to capture all of the information that we have in the minimal number of schemas with the most um, um, information that we can capture about our experiments and studies and, and have those connected relationally so that we can traverse through those tables to find the information that we need. Um, and a, a critical part of that has been that we have a data architect in place so that we can really understand the scientific data, how it should be stored, what gives us the maximum flexibility. Another component that we have is a, a data ontologist. Uh, so someone who really does understand the, the controlled vocabularies for scientific information so that we speak one language across Biogen and that we don't have uh, multiple uh, uh, types of terminology for a single piece of information so that it's really easy to query this data in the future. And then I would say the last component really is to have a data governance committee. And that committee is made up of people who are the actual scientific leadership uh, at Biogen so that they can weigh in on um, maybe parts of the data model that we might have missed. And then we ultimately ask them to sign off on that. And the reason we ask them to sign off on that is because they're going to be using this system for you know, years to come, and we really want them to be invested in it. So that sign off says that they are going to use the system. Great. Um, yeah, what I'm hearing from both of you is great flexibility and modularity um, to, to build the system today as well as deep into the future. Um, and I, I dare say enthusiastic participation from the organization to get it right, uh, which is always great to hear. Um, shifting a little bit back to the customer experience journey, um, I know, Iman, you said uh, Benchling is rolling things out on a fairly 
rapid schedule and often ahead of time um, at Sanofi. I'm curious, David, what the uh, rollout and user adoption has looked like at Biogen. Yeah, so it, we're deep into that process right now. So the, the approach that we took was to say that the people who are producing the majority of assets were going to be the people that we rolled out to first. And by assets, I mean the, the cell lines that are being created for uh, studies and experiments across our research units, the animals, the test articles that are going to be used in studies, uh, across our research units at, at Biogen. So we rolled out to those teams first so that their laboratory processes could be in the system quickly and we could build up an inventory of all of that information so that our research unit scientists simply had to come into the system and start using that information and to, to um, create their studies, create their experiments in the system, um, have that design available to them from day one. And so we've completed the rollout to our cellular sciences team, our gene therapy teams. We're in the process of rolling out to our in vivo sciences team right now. And then at, uh, at the beginning of the year, we're gonna start to roll out to our research unit scientists as well. Um, we, uh, we're also bringing, uh, we're just creating a research histology group um, and they, they will be using Benchling from day one. So we're gonna put um, all of their information management processes in place, and they're going to use the system from day one. And has adoption been pretty low friction? People are taking it up quickly? I think people are taking it up quickly. I think, that as always, there's the, the learning curve where there's a lot to learn initially, and then, you know, over time you get better at it and there's more uh, use of the system, and people really understand how to use the system to create their own templates. I think we're in, in that process right now. Okay. Um, you know, as we're realizing more and more of a solution, I'm curious to hear uh, what value you're getting from the software today. And maybe I mean, you can give us some notes on that front. Yeah, so one of the main benefits of the system is just how, how speedy it is really. Um, the uh, originally our our system used to operate through servers that would run uh, that would run from uh, different locations, and uh, they were really slow to to send back information to our computers. Like you would op you would try to click on a box to open so that you can enter some text, and sometimes it takes two three minutes just to get that box to open. I mean, using the entire notebook was really slow. Sometimes you spend overall throughout an entire day, you spend 30 minutes just waiting, cumulatively 30 minutes, just waiting on the system to respond. Versus now it's all so fast. You just click and whatever you want to enter, you're just available to enter it immediately. And any link within the system, you click on it, immediately the entity opens up. So. The, the speed has been really fantastic uh, upgrade from, from whatever system we used to have. Um, so, so that was really one of the big benefits. Another huge benefit was how everything is interconnected using the at mention. So any item we want to use in an experiment, we just at mention it. And, and it's such an easy way to link entities and experiments together and experiments and other experiments together. And even allows you to have true collaboration, uh, instant collaboration by mentioning people so that they get notifications that have been mentioned in an experiment. You can just mention someone that the uh, specific experiment is done and your res the results are ready. And that person can just click on a link from their email and go into that experiment so you don't have to take the data out and put it in a specific PowerPoint and send it to an email just specifically for that person. So it allows very quick organic collaboration without taking too much time uh, out, out of your day. Great, speedy and functional. I love to hear that. Uh, David, how about you? Summary of the value you're getting today for Biogen. Yeah, so I think we're able to answer scientific questions that we couldn't previously. So the idea of having findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data is that we're able to pull together data sets that may seem disparate right now, but when we make comparisons 
um, to the, the study design and really understand uh, the, the structured nature of the data, we can see that there are data sets that we can pull together for a meta-analysis that maybe we didn't think that we could previously do in the past. I would say we're able to do some other interesting things that we hadn't even thought of before. So the idea of being able to quality control assays. So we have standard, standard assays that we use across experiments uh, in Biogen. Can we see, are those performing uh, the same way across all of the programs that are using those? Um, can we see that the cell lines that we're creating are performing the same way across any experiment that they're used in? Are those actually the correct cell lines? Um, there was a paper a few years ago that said maybe 30% of the cell lines out there in the, in the world are mislabeled. So can we, can we tell that we have the correct cell lines? Are we able to, to QC a lot of the, the metadata that we're capturing into the system quickly and easily? So I, I think that those are some side benefits that we weren't expecting, um, but they're as critical as the main work that we're doing. Yeah, that's really, really cool to hear. Um, you know, you often think about answering your core scientific questions, but there's so much support and operational information at your fingertips. And if it's integrated in a single system, you're able to make much more use of it. Yeah, and I think that um, when you think of applying some of the advanced analytical tools like AI and ML, um, having a good understanding of the nature of your data is important. Those algorithms are garbage in, garbage out. And so having a full understanding of your experimental or study design um, really makes it possible to use those tools. Very true. Um, I'm in as a last thought, I'm curious what advice you would give to someone who is looking to start the conversation with their organization, their leadership, what would you tell them having gotten this far so far? Um, I would say Benchling has this great feature where they allow you to actually experiment with the system that give you a sandboxed system that you can start working in and, and build your uh, infrastructure and, and, and just test drive the system truly within your hands. So if you can, if you have, uh, you know, the, the resources to do that, I think this is a good place to start because it's, it's really hard to understand all the benefits of the system until you start using it. We can talk about it a lot, but until you test drive it, it's going to be hard to imagine how it's going to work and it's going to be hard to explain it to everyone else. So take advantage of that sandbox uh, feature that Benchling will allow you to do on a trial basis. And, and th that would be a great place to start. And I think we talked earlier, uh, both David and I, about the importance of data governance and your data model. So if you decided to, to adopt Benchling, um, th this is one of the first functions that I think you should put in place as well, if you don't have it already. And David, how about you? Yeah, I, I think, you know, to kick off the conversation with your organization, one approach that I would take is to talk about the fact that probably the second most valuable thing that you're creating in, in biopharma is data. So the first is the therapeutic, but then the second is the, is the data. And if we're not going to make use of it after its primary purpose, um, I think we're wasting a lot of the value in what we're creating. We spend billions of dollars on research per year. Um, you should make the best use of that data as you absolutely can. And with all of the experiments and, and studies and work that we do in the preclinical space, um, you're creating a lot of data exhaust and you should be capturing that and reusing it as best as possible. And those secondary uses may not seem uh, important to start with, but uh, data scientists really can pull a lot of information out of that data as part of a secondary use. So you shouldn't ignore it. That's great. Well, um, thank you both so much for sharing your insights. Um, we're we're going to head into the Q&A portion, getting questions from our audience. And I want to remind the audience that any questions we don't get to right now will be answered in a follow-up after this event. 
Um, the first question is from Michael, and this one is directed to David. Um, how did IT and scientific business partners at Biogen work together for a successful implementation thus far? Yeah, so this was uh, quite interesting. So we do have a, a research IT team that worked very closely with us in trying to understand our requirements, putting together a request for a proposal and talking to the various vendors who would um, who we would engage with to bring a new system into to Biogen and, and having that organization talk to the scientists and understand their needs was critical. Um, and when it came time to make a decision to go with Benchling, um, having that IT team really come in and talk about what are the capabilities of the system, what are the advantages, um, and seeing that in light with the other vendors that we may have looked at as well, um, was critical in, in you know, building that trust with the scientific leadership really did help us with the implementation. And so having both the, the research organization and the IT organization work very closely together really does smooth the process of, of onboarding a new technology like this. It sounds like in your case, IT really uh, provided a, a helpful framework to understand how to ask the right questions, basically. Yeah, that's correct. Awesome. Um, well, I'm in this one comes from Brittany to you. What are your key pieces of advice for a successful implementation? I think one of the key um, things to keep in mind is that your scientists are going to use that system. So you need to build it, not just with them in mind, but you need to build it with, with their help. You need to understand exactly what they need, what are their workflows, what are the templates that they require for all their different experiments and build it around that. Don't build the system and just hand it over to the scientist and ask them to use it. So, so that's, that's one key aspect to have, you know, good adoption by the scientist for, for your systems. Um, Another item would be, uh, I think we, we, we need to get back to that data governance uh, item. And, and that aspect affects uh, the, the templates and the workflows and the schemas in the background of Benchling. And I think it's important for the scientists to understand how Benchling is structured in the back end, not just how to use it on the front end, because that will allow them to help your IT organization to build the system in proper way to, to really take advantage of all the features that are built in. Excellent. Um, here's a question from Aaron from for both of you. Uh, what are some of your future goals for using the platform? And David, we'll start with you and Viagen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what we would really like to do is have an integrated research information management environment. And to do that, that does mean rolling out to our, our entire research organization. We have a therapeutics organization that we would like to fully roll this out to as well. Um, and then our manufacturing group, uh, we would like to be able to pass data to them as well as our, our um, clinical teams as well. So really this is around making this the centerpiece of our integration of our entire um, data management system at, at Biogen. Okay. One system to rule them all. <laughs> yes. Um, all right. Lastly, um, this is for both of you. What were the biggest challenges you were facing before you had the solution and what feedback were your scientific teams telling you they were struggling with? Um, Iman, why don't you go first? Um, we were having real big issues with our inventory management system and with data traceability, um, where, where, all the, where all the information is coming from, um, how is it all interconnected, how the different experiments relate to each other, how all the different test articles are related to those experiments, just having a traceability of our uh, experiment, that, that, that was a, an issue that, that we were trying hard to, to get around using our legacy systems. And then by moving to Benchling, because it's such an integrated system where, where all these requirements that we need in our daily job were met, it just became so much easier to, to keep track of all these issues. So, so that is 
really one one big item that that helped us a lot in our uh, in our department. And you were getting, uh, I assume, the the scientific teams were making noise about that quite a bit then. Yes, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> sometimes scientists would would you know do their notebook almost two three weeks later just because it was such a chore to do the notebook and and now that uh, you know we have benchling a lot of them are actually using it as where they start their experiment they design it in benchling and they go to the lab and execute it through computers that are at the benches they execute immediately at the benches uh, reading directly from benchling so it's it's day and night being able to use the system versus our legacy systems. Um, David, I know you had mentioned a lot around fair principles and uh, regulatory requirements, but I'm curious what sorts of feedback you heard from your scientific teams and what challenges they were facing that have so far been solved with Benchling. Yeah, I, I think that Iman has hit the the nail on the head here. Is that um, our current yeah, or the ELN that we're using uh, was really functioning as paper on glass. So people were taking um, Excel files or they were taking PDFs or they were taking PowerPoints and they were simply just pasting them into ELN. And that created a system that was entirely impossible to search through um, and locate the information that you needed. So we were hearing from the scientists that they very much disliked that. They disliked the interface for how they were using the, the ELN at Biogen and that they they wanted a change. And so I think that this idea of being able to design their experiments and studies directly in Benchling and then be able to run those in Benchling as well has, has been something that uh, the scientists weren't even really thinking of, but they, they like quite a lot. Um, and I, I think moving forward at, at Biogen that um, we're going to see a lot more groups that maybe didn't have any system in place really, or weren't using anything other than Excel spreadsheets start to adopt this and um, be quite happy with the interface and, and how they would use it. That's fantastic. Uh, so I'm in for you as well. Uh, what are, what are some of the future goals for Sanofi on the platform? So obviously we wanted to finish deploying within Sanofi the benchling. And uh, we're still in the early stages. We, we still have more than 60 or 70 percent of, of our research department not, not on benchling platform right now. So uh, finishing that is, is, a, is a big uh, target. But also we want to start taking advantage of benchling uh, lab automation features. And uh, we piloted that in our uh, next generation sequencing uh, lab, where uh, we're doing data analysis and QC through a workflow that starts with the Illumina sequencing machines and go through Benchling. And then we're taking advantage of that integration with AWS to analyze a lot of data using Lambda functions, for example, and, and getting the QC data back directly into Benchling so that when the experiment is over, the QC data is already within the system. So we want to see how much more we can use lab automation to, to do this type of analysis and function on the fly as big data is generated within the systems. So um, yeah, um, lab automation is, is one of those, those big item lists that, that we're looking into. Great. Well, we're just about at time for today's webinar. I wanna thank you, David and Iman, for your time and for being extraordinary partners to Benchling. And I'm gonna send it back to Ben now. Thank you so much, Loren, and thank you to Eamon and David for an excellent discussion. We may have run out of time, but you can continue to send your questions to us via the Q&A box, and we'll be sure to share those with today's speakers shortly afterwards. Also, please don't forget those two items below in the Resource Centre. If you're interested, be sure to check them out. So thanks once again to our presenters today for sharing your excellent insights and for taking questions from our farmer community. This session will soon be available on demand, so if any of your colleagues were unable to join us, please do feel free to share the link with them. Thank you once again to Benchling and of course to all of our attendees for joining us today. We have come to the end of today's webinar and we look forward to seeing you all again very soon.
Goodbye.